Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Viana Ravinka. For the Obama administration, tackling the faltering U.S. economy is the priority, but foreign diplomacy is also high on the agenda. And high on the list of sensitive diplomatic issues is the relationship between the U.S. and Russia. Recently, it's been somewhat chilly, and the Russian president reacted to Obama's victory with a challenge. Drop George Bush's foreign policy or else. On this edition of Independent Sources, we'll talk about what this saber-rattling means for the United States, Russia, and for the rest of Eastern Europe. We sit down with CUNY journalism professor Lani Isabel for his reaction to how some African-American reporters reacted to the Obama victory. Independent Sources co-host Gary Pierre Pierre gives us an update on the collapse of a school in Haiti, where nearly 100 people died. But first, Zyphus Lebron talked with a journalist from the Russian media about the Obama presidency and U.S. foreign policy toward Russia. Thanks, Vianora. We're outside of the U.N. building with Dmitry Gonostayev of RIA Novosti, the Russian news agency. Thanks for joining us, Dmitry. Thank you very much. It's been uh, at least uh, a week since Barack Obama's uh, election. So what has the sense been from Russia since this election? There are a lot of expectations, but uh, the challenge is that uh, these expectations in Russia could turn into illusions and uh, many people do not want to be impacted again by the uh, illusions that will become, you know, like uh, lovers, uh, I mean, the United States and uh, uh, Russia. We would like to be friends, but uh, uh, not, not, maybe not friends, but partners, partners which have uh, uh, common goals uh, and uh, common, uh, common possibility to share its views. Obama's foreign policy in terms of uh, strategic relationship with the Russian Federation uh, will uh, have uh, the same basis. Uh, the nuances may be different, right. but the uh, base of this relationship will be the same. To pursue United States interests in Europe globally, and that means that the uh, United States will challenge Russia or see challenges from Russia. Now, Dimitri, you raised a very important point earlier about the fact that Barack Obama is not seeking to improve personal relations with, the, with Russia. Is that something that is respected by the Russian community, you think, rather than in the case of George W. Bush when he talked about the fact that he, he saw the soul of Vladimir Putin in, in his eyes? You know, these words uh, of uh, looking into one's eyes is something for the general public. But uh, I think that uh, the leadership understands that uh, no uh, strategic, no political relations can be based uh, just on uh, personal relationship. Uh, that means that uh, Barack Obama, I think, uh, he understands that and he's not going to be involved in some kind of uh, um, bad diplomacy which used to be during Yeltsin's times when he uh, invited uh, a German chancellor uh, to, 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 the, to the Russian battles uh, or something like that. Uh, I think Barack Obama is going to study, first of all, to study uh, thoroughly uh, the whole scope of the relations between Russia and the United States during the previous presidencies. And afterwards he will uh, uh, consult his uh, advisors, consult his foreign policy uh, advisors and then he will uh, try to elaborate maybe a new kind of diplomacy, a new kind of uh, foreign policy. Only a day after Barack Obama's election, President Medvedev had said that he would put short-range missiles on the, in Kaliningrad, which is on the close bordering Poland. Some people in the international community say this is just a lot of hot air on Medvedev's part to make, to make a point that he will not allow NATO's further expansion east. Um, is that kind of the sentiment that's coming from the rest of Russia, that this is really just a, a certain amount of saber rattling on his part? Russia needs to react to some steps which are seen in Russia as uh, uh, aggressive steps and uh, which are seen as uh, measures uh, aimed at uh, Russia. And that's why uh, it's quite logic for Russia to, to make such a response. So right, so it's a matter of protecting sovereignty in this case. Uh, I don't think it's a matter of sovereignty or protecting sovereignty. It's a matter of protecting the country, of protecting the uh, ability to be an equal partner uh, in Europe, to be an equal partner in Euro-Atlantic community. We need to mention that uh, all these um, uh, projects which were elaborated during uh, George W. Bush administration uh, about uh, anti-ballistic missile shields. It was perceived very uh, negatively, not only uh, among the Russian leadership, but among the 
common Russians which clearly uh, remember the days of the Cold War when uh, Star Wars program was uh, elaborated here in the United States. We do not want uh, the situation to, to be the same again, uh, but if the United States decides to, to move its uh, military infrastructure towards the Russian borders, uh, Russia clearly needs to, to, to react to response in some way. Barack Obama is not as in favor of this uh, missile program that's being set up by George Bush in Poland. So do you think that in some way, fashion or form, it may help smooth over the relationship if Obama perhaps does, is not as gung-ho about continuing this missile uh, defense program in Poland? Do you think it may help um, with the relations with Russia? Yes, yes, surely it may help. And uh, there are some signs that uh, Barack Obama is going to, to pursue with uh, some diplomatic means. Russia has uh, proposed uh, several months ago to run uh, the joint project of countering common threats, such as uh, the nuclear threat, such as a uh, uh, missile threat, which might have been in minds of some rock states. Uh, but uh, the uh, George W. Bush administration has uh, uh, responded negatively to that proposal. And uh, I think that uh, Russia uh, hopes that uh, the new administration under Barack Obama will uh, try to, to negotiate on this particular issue with uh, uh, the Kremlin and that may, uh, that may open the path for uh, further uh, improving the relationship between our countries. All right, Dmitry Gonostayev of Rio Novosti, thanks for being with us and we'll send it back to you via Nora in the studio. Joining me to discuss the Polish reaction to the election of Barack Obama and the warnings from Russia is Andrzej Dobrowolski, news editor for Novigenik, a Polish language daily. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for inviting me. Much of the world media have greeted Obama's win positively. How has Novigenik and uh, the Polish media received it? I think that almost all Polish media received his uh, election with enthusiasm and it was demonstrated on, also by the people whom we interviewed uh, just a couple of days ago. I had a chance to talk to uh, seven or nine uh, leaders of the Polish-American community in New York and only one person who is who was perhaps the richest and he was involved in uh, Republican uh, politics only this one person was not happy with Mr. Obama he said that uh, the economy will be even worse than it is that he didn't trust him but rest of them you know were were enthusiastic with with the election of Mr. Obama although some of of, of people uh, told me that they would wait until he is uh, president and he will see uh, how he will proceed with, with all of these, the most important issues. And the Polish media in Poland, what was the coverage like? Most of, of, of Polish media received Mr. Obama positively and they even had some polls which indicated that uh, Polish people are very happy with the, with the election of Mr. Obama. For example, the most perhaps respected uh, Polish paper, Gazeta Wyborcza, conducted a poll which indicated that over over 50 percent of people uh, were were happy with with Mr. Obama and they believed that about 70 or 75 percent of people believed that he will be a better president than Mr. Bush. Uh, about 90 percent of, of people said that it is okay that he's a young president and over 70 percent of people uh, also said that it didn't matter that he was a black person, African-American politician. The day Obama was announced president-elect, Russia took a confrontational stance towards the U.S. on the missile issue mm -hmm. uh, in which Poland plays central role. How much has Novigenik or the Polish media talked about this? We wrote about this for, for some time. It was not the first statement that 
Russian politicians or Russian generals expressed their view. But we have to understand that they have their own interest, while America and Poland have uh, their own interests, which are different, and that's obvious. And uh, certainly Poland had so uh, bad relations with the Soviet Union at first, and then when President, uh, President Putin uh, took power, uh, our relations were complicated, so Poland doesn't trust Russia. Poland is very careful because of our history. So Poland has to take care of its own security. And since we didn't have very good experience also with our European, West European uh, allies in the, in the past, Poland want to be friendly with the United States and the Polish government wants to have a kind of a double indemnity, if I can say it. And the day that uh, Russia announced uh, that they will deploy missiles on the border with Poland, has the uh, Polish media picked up on it? Has Novigenic picked up on it? Have you, what, what were the opinions expressed um, in this regard? Certainly. Polish media are criticizing Russia for this because everybody says that the, the, the anti-missile uh, defense system which is to be installed in Poland is not directed against Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, it consists of 10 rockets. So, uh, you know, with the confrontation of the huge Russian uh, military uh, nuclear potential, it is nothing. But I think that it has, for Russia, it has maybe a symbolic uh, significance. They don't want to, 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 to America to be so close to the Russian border and it was a reaction. Yes, and talking about this symbolic um, stance by Russia mm -hmm. that, you're, that you're saying, mm -hmm. after the conflict in Georgia escalated a few months ago, mm -hmm. uh, Russian President Medvedev actually said, we're not afraid of a Cold War, quote unquote. Um, with the latest statements uh, by, by Russia about the missiles being deployed on the Poland border, uh, do pundits in uh, Poland talk about the resurgence of a Cold War? Do you feel that Russia is trying to maintain its sphere of influence? Are media people talking about this? Certainly, Russia will try to, 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 to influence all of the uh, four members of, of, the, of the Russian bloc, but they have no chance because Poland is a part of NATO right now, and similarly some other East European countries join either NATO or the European Union. So they have no chance to influence to such a high degree those countries as if they did before. And I don't think that Russia is, is afraid of the Cold War. It is perhaps rather a matter of the Russian pride, you know, and they don't want, they don't want America to be so close that, because they think that the, it is their region. And that's, that's the issue, that's the point, in my opinion. But before the election results, um, mm -hmm. when you were here in the studio, you mentioned that um, much of the polls are, uh, many of the polls are um, inclined to vote for McCain because they see McCain as a hardliner towards Russia. Um, do you believe that this is what they were, were afraid of? Uh, for example, Med Medvedev's um, strong statement against the U.S. the first day Obama was announced winner? I don't think that people are afraid, but as I mentioned, people have to be very careful because Russia doesn't belong to uh, countries which are predictable and we never know what happens. We believe then as a part of NATO, Poland is much safer, but we still have some other assurances, uh, particularly for Polish government, for Polish people, it is very important to have very good relations with the United States. And it was the reason that Polish government and Polish people accepted the American invitation, you know, to join this anti-missile system, which is a different system, which, which, which is not dangerous for Russia, but 
But perhaps they're still in the Cold War mentality. Yes, and we know that Mr. Putin was part of KGB, so it is not easy, you know, to change your character to, to so so quickly as it was in the case of the much younger people. We will see maybe Mr. Medvedev, which will, will be more, much more pragmatic president, but it will take time. Of, and as long as, as Mr. Putin, you know, is the prime minister, as he rules Russia, in fact, I don't know whether it will be a significant change in Russian politics. Andrzej Dobrowolski, thanks for being with us. Now here's Zyphus Lebron with some other news. Thanks, Yanora. Here's a look at some stories from New York's ethnic media. A new research study shows that Caribbean and Central American immigrants living in Long Island, Suffolk, and Nassau counties are contributing more in taxes than they receive in government benefits. That from New York Carib News. Koreans can now visit America without a visa. The Future Korea Journal reports that the U.S. recently accepted South Korea as a member of the visa waiver program. From Caribbean Life, economists at the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean say the financial downturn in the U.S. will have a grave effect on the Caribbean's tourism industry. From the Polish Daily News, the city is introducing a new rezoning plan in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, to control excessive building in that area. Developers will be required to offer low-income housing in buildings that stretch beyond certain height limits. And finally, India has taken off into space. News India Times reports that the country recently began its lunar mission, making it the third nation in Asia to do so. Those are just a few of the stories from New York's ethnic media. Back to you, Vianora. Thanks, Zyphus. After Barack Obama's victory, some African-American journalists were openly emotional and even talked about what it meant to them personally to see a black man ascend to the presidency. Abby Shola talked with CUNY journalism professor Lani Isabel about maintaining emotional distance from a story. So, Professor Isabel, some African-American journalists openly expressed their personal feelings when they covered Barack Obama's election. I want to play you a clip of a reporter on BET who became really quite emotional. How are you feeling right now? I'm sitting here thinking about all the people who didn't make it to see this moment, but then I think about the people who did, and it is people like, you know, I have a grandmother, Catherine Venable, sitting at home, who's almost 90, who raised my mother and her siblings who, you know, they picked cotton in cotton country in Oklahoma. That's how they grew up. You know, my mother got spit on. She got spit on. Aren't journalists supposed to maintain an emotional distance from their stories? Yes, but the question has become more difficult as journalism moves into less sure footing itself. Uh, for example, uh, what is a reporter? Uh, quite often the lines of commentary and reporting are so intermingled with blogging and with other things and with television commentary particularly that it's difficult to understand who is exactly going to be this sort of journalist who's not going to be emotional. Um, it's complicated also because this is an emotional moment. When the Hindenburg uh, went into flame, the, uh, the, the person who was announcing this live on television reacted emotionally. Uh, when Willie Mays made a great catch in the World Series, he re reacted emotionally. It's, it's important to react emotionally. In politics, however, you're forever, forever have this legacy of having been so supportive of one candidate. So therefore, how can you be believed to then cover Obama fairly for the next four years. African American newspapers, many of them reported straight news stories. Do you think there's something about television where people get caught up in the moment? Well, television is a much more emotional medium. Uh, it's much more given to uh, interpretation of facial expressions, of tone of voice. Uh, when somebody openly weeps, it certainly presents dramatic television. Um, and it is I would suppose it would be easier to write your story, uh, go to uh, outside and have a smoke and scream and yell and do all kinds of things, come back and continue to write your story, and it gets into the paper the next day as a story that no one really has seen all these other asides. In television, that's impossible, and it goes by very, very quickly. 
And I think that it does stamp you forever because that video evidence is always going to be there. Like it ended up on YouTube. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Probably a few minutes after it appeared. A lot of people have talked about how BET covered the election. Um, the New York Times even wrote a piece about it. Yes. Um, and I know there's been a lot of buzz on the Pointer Education Institute for Journalism. Mm -hmm. um, what have people been saying on Pointer? They've been pretty much taking a hard edge and saying that journalists should not be emotional. Journalists should not join. Journalists should not show uh, in this way of uh, emotion. And there are others who say this is an important event uh, for African Americans, uh, unlike other groups. And so therefore, the, the chief uh, identified uh, black network would then be allowed to go to some extremes because of the population that they, uh, that, who are their viewers. The African American press, just like most ethnic media, historically have been acted as advocates for the community. Do you think that makes this sort of coverage okay? Well, it, it, if you present yourself as an advocate for the community, yes. Uh, my, my understanding is that BET saw itself in, in covering this campaign not as an advocate for the Obama campaign, uh, but as advocates for, uh, for fair journalism. Um, you know, so I think that, that the problem uh, presents itself uh, if you try to become fair at some times and not fair and unbiased at other times. You can either do it once and uh, be judged unfair or not do it at all. Uh, with blacks, though, particularly, uh, people are suspect about whether blacks can be impartial when dealing with, with other blacks. Uh, when news organizations were first beginning to cover Africa and sending correspondence there, many of the blacks reporters felt that they were being judged by a different uh, a level of scrutiny. People wanted to know whether they could cover Africa fairly. Uh, no one really asked whether white reporters can cover George Bush fairly. Um, I think that that's a burden that has existed, uh, that it'll be very interesting to see how it proceeds as we go into the Obama administration. We'll be right back. You promised me the world. Is this what you had in mind? Help Earthshare and its members restore balance to the world. Visit earthshare.org and see what you can do. Earthshare, one environment, one simple way to care for it. Close to 100 people died and scores more were injured when a school collapsed in Haiti last Friday. Independent Sources co-host Gary Pierre Pierre just returned from Haiti and gave us this account. Gary, you just returned from Haiti and you arrived in the midst of yet another catastrophe. 93 people, children, dead after school collapsed. What was it like? Well, it was really uh, chaotic. I mean, I got there and I heard it at the airport that there was an accident and my first reaction was, well, yeah, so what? And then uh, as I heard a little bit more about it and my instinct was just to really leave it alone. But the more I learned about it, I just went immediately to the scene and, and started working. Uh, I showed bodies being dragged out. Uh, people were just doing anything they could. I mean, at that point, uh, rescue workers had not arrived yet. You had just regular people trying to give a help of them, digging people, uh, little children from the rubble and trying to get them to the hospital and, and there was a sense of total chaos and uh, later on uh, when uh, rescue workers started coming to the UN, as you know, UN uh, forces are in Haiti so they started arriving to the scene and, and seal the perimeter and try to get some order back into uh, rescuing people, trying to get as many people alive because uh, just dragging bodies is not the best thing. Uh, and so they were doing more harm than good despite their best intentions. So this was really, really a gut-wrenching scene. I think that initial reaction of, and so what? Because unfortunately in some countries there is a steady stream of catastrophe, of disaster. 
what makes this one different? What did the, what buttons did this press for Haitians? Well, everyone is 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 uh, affected by this, Michelle. When you look at it, a lot of people have children. You send your child to school so they could be safe. Uh, th this is a sanctuary where they're protected. And when you hear a school collapsing and children dying, that touches the heart of just even the most hardened person. And, and it resonates across the board. Brothers, sisters, nephews, uncles, just about everything. You can feel this. And I saw that uh, Friday and throughout yesterday, even on uh, Tuesday when I left, people were still mourning the death of these children. Uh, and, and, and the circumstances uh, were really uh, alarming, the way that it occurred. It was a party at the school to celebrate uh, something or another. I'm not quite sure what it was, but it was a little party at the school. And they were just jumping and dancing when the student just collapsed. So let's get a sense as to why the school collapsed. Well, this is really an example of when you have a weak central government and a almost non-existent local government. The, the reverend who uh, built the school, and he actually did it himself from what I, was gather, what I gathered in, in, in Haiti. Uh, he applied for a permit in the early 1990s. He was denied because it was a steep hill without any uh, where to uh, erect a strong foundation for the school. So the authorities at the time told him, no, this is not fit for uh, construction anymore. Uh, hence, there was a, a coup d'etat and no government at the time. So he went and built the school. And now you have this tragedy. In the news, we've seen that the United Nations sent, is going to send some $10.2 million in rescue aid for the farmers that were affected by the storms. The United States sent rescue workers. And so we see this sort of what seems like goodwill on part of the international community uh, for a country in crisis. But how is this received in Haiti, among Haitians, in the United States and in Haiti? Is there some mixed feelings about this coming to the rescue? Well, there's a sense of shame. Haitians are deeply, uh, fiercely independent. Uh, they fought for their independence in 1804, but unfortunately, they still haven't really uh, come out of independence. Uh, you know, right now, Haiti is under UN protectorate. I mean, that's what you have to call it. Uh, since 2004, when Jean Bertrand Aristide was forced into exile yet again. And, but there's a sense of resignation. What do you do? Because you just, this is a country that's been badly ruled since the outset of independence. There are a lot of reasons for that, and we don't have time on the show to go <laughs> into that. But yeah, it, it just feel like there is no uh, end to this misery. Uh, one of the things that I heard a woman who was just talking to herself said, you know, when the end of the world starts, it will start with Haiti. And I thought, oh, wow, that's pretty deep. Oh, that's very significant. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's our show. Thanks for watching and join us again next week. In the meantime, be independent-minded.